segment I want to get into the Canon PowerShot series of firmware hacks. Now I'm running on um, a Canon A590. It's a pretty good camera. I got it for about $120 as recommended to me by Nick from Techcentric and Thomas. Now I'm not going to get into the features of CHDK. We'll get into that in a minute. But the reason for using it is it unlocks a lot of power from the camera itself. Games, scripting, manual controls, automated controls, you name it, it's got it. Now Typically, it's just a very, you know, it's a point, a point and shoot camera. You point it at whatever you want to take a picture of, it takes all the auto settings. It's got some manual features, but this CHDK adds so much more. Now, I, I, there's no way of actually going wrong because it only resides on the SD card, which means if you don't like it, you just take it off the SD card. Or you can just hit the lock, uh, the right protect lock switch on the SD card and it won't boot anymore. It's totally safe. There's nothing, you can't mess anything up. The only way you can physically do anything wrong with this is if you drop the camera somehow. And that's not CHDK's fault, it's your fault, because you're a fucking idiot. Anyway, let's go to the computer side, we'll get CHDK on the actual camera, and I'll show you some of the features and functions. Alright, as always, first thing you want to do is go to the CHDK website, and check out all the information that they have there. Now, right on the homepage, they're going to tell you what CHDK is all about, and what cameras are actually supported. Now, they do support about 30 or so actual Canon cameras right now, and they'll actually go through the uh, explicit discrepancies between what cameras can do what and what's, you know, in beta and whatnot. It also gives you uh, some of the major CHDK features, uh, enabling raw mode, override camera parameters, bracketing, video override, scripting, motion detecting, edge overlay, live histograms, zebra mode, grids, multilingual interfaces, and more. There are text readers, games, USB remotes, benchmarks, user menus. There is so much to this, I can go on for hours, but I don't have the time. So, the first thing you want to do is actually download an application called Card Tricks. You can go into the CHDK wiki, or just go straight to the downloads and find Card Tricks. Now, I've already gone ahead and I've made a folder, and I've downloaded Card Tricks. What Card Tricks will do is um, insert your SD card into your reader, whatever it may be. I've already done that. Uh, there it is, right on my E-Drive. Now, catch-22 is you can't use cards over 4 gigs. Granted that the default firmware can read uh, cards, SDHC compatible, you need to actually format this as FAT16. Alright, so you can click the SD card icon right here, or you can, if you're a total idiot and you don't know where the card, your SD card it lies on your computer, you can go and click auto. But I'm not an idiot, I know where it is. It's on my eDrive. So, uh, we're gonna, it tells you everything about the card, the space, drive label, we're gonna format it as FAT, and it's gonna warn you, formatting will destroy all data, so if you have any information on this card, back it up. Alright, second thing you need to do is make the card bootable. Click the Make Bootable tab. And it says, Card is now bootable in Canon cameras. Do not forget to set the right protect on the card. Slide the tab up away from the electric connectors to take advantage of this feature. Basically what it's telling you is to enable CHDK, you need to actually enable the right protect lock on the SD card. So if at any time, if grandma, grandpa, mom, or dad, or brother, sister who doesn't know how to use a damn thing in the house, including the toaster oven, wants to use a very stupid camera, all you need to do is disable that right protect. It goes right back to the normal firmware. All right, so we're going to go to download CHDK, and it's going to go ahead and put it on the card. So, oh wait, first we, oh wait, we made it bootable. So download CHDK. Uh, you know what? I've already done that. So, so I've already downloaded the latest CHDK build for my camera right here. It's going to ask where it is. Okay, it's going to unzip it to the eDrive and do all of the magic for us. Once this is done. We eject the SD card, enable right protect, insert it into the camera. I'm going to cut frame, go over to that. I've gone ahead and put my SD card in my camera, fresh set of batteries for you guys. Now I've got it in playback mode, 
when it boots up, it'll say CHDK, your firmware number, and revision and all that jazz. So right now I've got it in playback mode. And if you hit the secondary button on your camera, for at least for mine, you'll notice it'll have Alt at the bottom, meaning you're in an Alt function. And then you hit Menu. And you can bring up the playback menu features. Extra photo operations, video parameters, raw mode, edge overlay, custom curves, histogram, blah, 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 miscellaneous stuff. File browser, calendar, text file reader, games. Oh, that's always fun. Hey, look. Reversi, Sobukan, and Connect 4. Hey, look, Connect 4. I suck at Connect 4. Yay, Connect 4. Okay, if you want to exit, you hit your menu button, and you can go back. Show splash screen on load, startup sound, use zoom buttons for manual focus, disable LCDs, uh, dr what your drawing palette wants uh, should be, show how much memory you've got left, make the card bootable, debug parameters, remote parameters. There's a lot of stuff in here. So you know what, I'm going to go back into uh, video mode. And here's the typical camera. Now, I'm actually going to, uh, I mean, you know, we've got the, the typical stuff of a camera. We've got the viewfinder, we've got uh, the exposure and the f-stop. So we're going to hit secondary function. And you notice now that we've got a battery meter, how much space we have on the card left, uh, the time of day. So we're going to hit our alt function. And you notice at the bottom says default script loaded. We're going to hit function set, and we can actually load alternate scripts. Those scripts could be security scripts that detect motion, uh, stop motion animation, time lapse, whatever. Actually, uh, go to the CHDK uh, wiki, and it'll explain what actual formats of scripting it actually supports. I know it has a, a version of basic LUH and a custom one. So we're going to go back a menu, try to. All right, so hitting Alt the menu brings to the main menu. So we've got the extra photo op uh, operations, which you know disable or enable overrides, like the ISO settings, the exposure settings, the focal point settings, uh, the shutter speed settings, the subject distance variables, uh, bracketing in continuous mode. There are more features and settings here than you'd probably find on a professional camera. Um, we've also got the video parameters in what mode, bit rate, quality, uh, clear video parameters on start, yes or no, fast video control, you got it if you want it. Video quality control, uh, autofocus key, you can re reassign keys to do whatever the hell you want. The raw parameters, the, uh, saving the images in actual raw format, uncompressed format, what kind of format, file type, prefix, extensions, uh, subtract prefix, blah, blah, blah. There's so much crap here I can go on for an hour on just about raw mode itself. This, if you want to get into pro photography with a low-end camera, this would be the one to use. It's got edge overlays. I really don't mess with that too much. Custom curves, don't mess around with that too much. Histogram parameters, I like the histogram. The histogram will actually, uh, the way I have it set up, is uh, not only will it show me a histogram of, of what's in the area, if you notice now I've got that, that actual histogram, that'll change depending on the lighting. It'll actually tell, tell me how much in an RGB setting it'll actually be exposed to the actual CCD right here. But right this, this black block, you know, I've got the, the, uh, the light to my, to my living room really uh, low right now, but that little square that actually shows you what you're gonna be pointing at actually gives you an, uh, a digital zoom of what you're taking a picture of. You can quite literally change the f-stop, the focal point, the zoom, the exposure, everything in here. What you see on screen, what you don't see on screen. And everything is completely safe. If you don't like any of these features and you don't want to see them anymore, or you want to give you know mom and pop the camera to take some quick shots of whatever the hell, take the SD card out, enable, uh, disable the right protect, you boot right back up to the normal uh, firmware. Now, these are just some of the basic features of CHDK. You can really dive face first into it and really get into it and script your camera to however you want, or you can leave it, or like me, just play around with some of the more basic settings like f-stop, focal point, and exposure, and all that jazz, and get your camera looking and feeling the way you want it. That's the point of CHDK. All right, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed. As always, information can be found on the CHDK website. Show notes are on the, on the forums, or you can catch us on IRC. All right, how many times has this happened to you? You're driving along, minding your own business, leaning your head out the window and screaming about the impending alien bird invasion. It's easy to lose track of time, you see. 
but before you know it, you find yourself hopelessly and mind-numbingly lost. So what do you do? Well, you could call your friends or family and ask for directions, but that's hit or miss depending on where you are and if your family's location retarded like I am. Uh, you could pull over and ask Bart Bubblehead for directions, but then you run the risk of having your car and or anal virginity stolen. No thanks. Uh, you could wing it, backtrack, and hope you find a familiar landmark or road, but if you have the sense of direction of a dead cat like I do, you'll wind up more lost, and quite possibly in another state. This is where GPS comes in. GPS stands for Global Positioning System. Uh, the way it works is pretty complicated, but basically there are a bunch of satellites up in space in a predefined orbit, constantly s sending signals down to the surface. These signals consist of the time the message was sent, information about where the satellite is in relation to its surrounding satellites and orbit, and some technical data. A GPS receiver takes these signals from several satellites at once, calculates the time and other data received, and gives you a fairly accurate lock on where your location is. Uh, if you'd like a more detailed and, and intricate ins explanation of this, hit Wikipedia. I know they have a good article on it, and they actually show the, the calculations that the re GPS receivers use, but that's beyond its, the scope of this segment. Uh, today I want to go over some basic GPS technology uh, programs for the smartphone as well as a uh, PC. Um, I am, in fact, completely lost, so let's get started. Alright, as you can see I actually am out in the middle of nowhere, um, so what better time to try out my GPS gear than out in the field? Uh, no, let's not try it out in the nice warm cozy house, let's do it out in the field in the snow and the slush and the icy rain. Dickweed. Anyway, uh, GPS devices can range from standalone devices like the TomTom -tom that you just stick to your windshield uh, to car pewters that have Bluetooth built in and every bell and whistle that you'll never need to phones with built-in AGPS. Uh, AGPS stands for uh, Assisted GPS. From my understanding, uh, it basically helps the GPS lock on to your location with the help of cell phone tower triangulation. Uh, I don't have access to that to a phone with AGPS, so I can't really, you know, test it or show you guys. Uh, you're gonna have to take my word for it, or look on Wikipedia, like I said. Don't be lazy. Uh, what I do have is an old Garmin GPS device, which I'm really not going to be using too much today. It's very basic, uh, just spits out, you know, GPS coordinates, and it'll give you a track, but there's no mapping or uh, routing capability of it. Now, it takes a while to sync just because it's older. Uh, the thing I've noticed is that the newer devices can lock on faster. It's different protocols and, and such. I'm not really going to get into that today just because I, you know, it's too, yeah, whatever. I'm cold. <laughs> Uh, I also have my er, first version Motorola Q, not the, the Q9, and a Bluetooth GPS dongle. Those go for about 50 bucks depending on where you look. It's not too bad considering what it does. And it'll interface with your phone, uh, computer, whatever. Uh, like I said, the programs I'm going to be showing today are mostly smartphone slash Windows Mobile based because that's what I have access to. Uh, I'll try and show you a couple programs on the computer side but I don't, I haven't really done all that much uh, researching and, you know, trying to find free GPS mapping programs. Alright, let's get started because from what I hear, hypothermia sets in quickly. Alright, for continuity's sake, just pretend there's snow on the ground. Um, first off, I'm not going to go over how to sync up your Bluetooth GPS with your phone because it's a pretty simple process. If you can't figure that out, uh, Go back to episode one and, and bang at your head with a hammer. That might help a little. Uh, oh, great suggestion, by the way. Great survival tip. If you find yourself lost and in the woods, just get out of your car and run towards the, towards the forest. It's a great idea, really. I'm doing it right now. I'm going to get out of here totally. <sighs> anyway, first program I want to show you is GPS test. This is a really simple diagnostic application. Hey, there's a tree and it's falling on my path. Okay, it's a really simple diagnostic application. As you can see here, it just shows you the satellites you're connected to and the signal strength. The signal strength on mine right now is crap because it's in my pocket. I only have two hands. Uh, next screen. Latitude, longitude, the, the current UTC time, your speed, and some other information that I don't really care about. 
It shows you how many satellites are in view, which is 12, and the amount that you're connected to, 9, which is I think the maximum that I can connect to. Different GPS have different uh, numbers of GPS satellites they can lock onto, but you only need, I think, 3 to, to maintain a decent lock. So that's GPS test. It's a really simple program, but gets the job done. I swear I've seen that tree before. Uh, the next program I want to go over is called Google Maps. I'm sure you've heard of it. If you haven't, uh, you're living in a box or something. Anyway, it's, it's much like the desktop version, only with GPS support, obviously, or else I probably wouldn't be using it. Uh, it doesn't do me all that much good out here because I'm not on a road. I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere. But you can see, you know, it shows that I'm in the middle of nowhere, it shows me, oh, Pond Creek, yeah, that's useful, thanks. Oh, and it says that I'm by train tracks. Yeah, I, I totally didn't see the train tracks that I was walking next to. Um, but on the road, in an urban environment, it's much more useful. And the search feature is, well, it's Google. So, I mean, if, you're, if you have your GPS on and it's locked onto your location, you just search, like, you know, I want pizza or, you know, dead hookers or whatever, and it'll come up with a the, with the location-based response. Very useful application. I use it all the time. A uh, similar program, which I'll just go over real quick, it's called Windows Live Search, which is like its desktop counterpart as well. Um, has many of the same features as Google Maps. In fact, a lot of it just overlaps, and I don't know. I like keeping both of them just because I'm paranoid, and you know, I figure if one fails, then the other has to work, and if both fail, I might as well just shoot myself in the face now. Uh, so yeah, this is Windows Live Search. Same features. It takes a little bit more to set up and use. Uh, you have to program in your, your location first and then uh, do a search based off of it, but it works about the same way. Really good program. Okay, so now that you hopefully know where you're going or where you are, perhaps you'd like to know where you've been and keep a track of your trip, which in my case wouldn't do me much good because it would just be a blank area of land and a bunch of circles or triangles or tetrahedrons. Anyway, uh, there's two programs that I found that, you, that are good for this, for Windows Mobile. First one, I don't know if it's called Sunset or something, but it's a, just a basic GPS logger. It takes your location based off the GPS data and saves it to a, I think it's a .gpx file. And you can go to like gpsvisualizer.com or there's a bunch of websites on there and put it over, like overlay it on a Google map. But that's what it looks like, really, really basic. Menu, start GPS trail, that's it. That's, that's really it. Very simple to use. Uh, the other one which I've actually just found recently is called GPS ED, or GPS ED, I don't know. Get it here. Tree, I will give you five seconds to let go of my camera. Ow. Alright, this is GPS ED, or GPS ED. Oops. I don't know. I don't know how it's called, what it's called. It's a dumb name for it. Uh, anyway, this shows your speed, distance. Well, when you start the track, which I'll, I guess I'll do. Go to menu, start a track, name the track. Uh, you can also share this. This allows you to share your location and trip and all that good stuff on Facebook, MySpace, whatever. Which, of course, I'm going to say no to forever. Uh, all right, so it's tracking now. It shows you your speed, distance, how far you've gone, how long it's been tracking, and your current heading. Oh, I'm going south. I thought I was going west, whatever. There's a couple different screens here. It shows you latitude, longitude, which I'm bleeping out. I don't want you to know where I've been, even though if you were here, you'd probably be miserably lost and I'd laugh at you. Uh, and it shows you a course. It's basically just... You know, like, in my case, it'll be a big circle when I'm done. It's a useful program. Unfortunately, it saves to a proprietary format, which I'm really, really not a fan of. You have to upload it to the website first and then download it as a GPX, which is a more standard uh, GPS track format. I really don't like that. There's some privacy issues with me, but I'm paranoid, and I'm sure they keep your data safe. Really.
Well, I've pretty much given up all hope of survival. Um, it's been about six hours now and I haven't found my way out. Uh, so I decided instead of building a fire and shelter and trying to survive, I'm going to go geocaching. Uh, if you don't know what geocaching is, basically it's like a hide and seek game for adults. Uh, I didn't think much of it, I really didn't think it would be that much fun, and then I realized there was a geocache site right here. So I'm going to go over the basics of geocaching and how to find stuff and put stuff in the places that you found it. Really, it's something you have to try. It, it sounds stupid, but it's, it's really fun. Um, so I'm going to go over the computer, or at least try to. Hope my battery doesn't go dead. This is geocaching.com, your main resource for geocaching. Derf. They maintain a large database of caches from around the world, and they also list trackable items and have individual cache reviews and hints. As I said before, it's really something you need to get out and do. I thought it was going to be a waste of time and a pointless exercise, but at this point I'll do anything I can to amuse myself. I looked up this particular cache before heading out. Apparently it's been here for a while. The website listed as being put here in 2003, and I'm curious as to its condition and to read some of the logbook entries. The best way to get into this hobby is to just skim through the website, do some searches, and find a cache in your area. You'd be surprised at just how many are out there. Don't be lazy. Alright, well that's the basics of geocaching. I mean, there isn't a lot to it. You just need your GPS and a sense of direction. Well, I'm one for two. Uh, I got the rough idea from the coordinates on the website, but they're usually off a little bit. So, the note said that they're among these pillars here. From what I can tell, I think it's from a fence. Uh, so I was looking around, and... Yeah, oh, there it is. Alright, it's right here. There we have it. Just an ammo container. Alright, well that didn't take as much time as I thought it would. Uh, I thought I was going to have to look around all over for it and everything, but the ones in the urban areas are usually a lot harder to find just because they have to be more creative and put them in various places and they're usually a lot smaller. But this is a giant ammo container, so there's only so many places you can put it. I'm thinking there might be some survival items in there, so I won't freeze tonight. Uh, so let's see what's inside it. Now I know a lot of geocachers are going to say, Don't open it on camera, that's against the geocaching way. Screw you. I'm in a survival situation. If there's something in here that can help me, I am certainly going to use it. A car. Hollywood keychain. A beanie baby. No, two beanie babies. Huh. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing in here that can that can be of any use to me whatsoever. Well, I'm going to use this logbook and fill out my last will and testament. Maybe someday somebody will find come by this and they'll find my dead rotting corpse holding this thing, clutching it close to my body. I hope this segment was useful to you. Uh, if you have any questions, hit me up on IRC. Oh wait, you can't because I'll be dead. Uh, I'm not the only one that knows about GPS stuff. I just wanted to do a segment on it. So, yeah, there's ask around. Get, get one of your friends involved, really. Go outside. Do something besides sit in front of the computer for a change. It's fun, really. Just don't get lost like me and die. Today we're going to be discussing amateur radio repeaters. And, uh, what is a repeater? Well, a repeater is basically just two radios, 69 together, with a duplexer in between. The duplexer handles the, the Vox control and some other shit, but it's really not a complicated machine at all. Technically, you could probably build one in your basement. It's not exactly legal to run your own without getting it verified through the FCC, but just saying, that's how easy it is to, to put one together. Now, what is a repeater used for? Well, when you're using a handheld radio like this, or even a mobile, you're not going to get out too far because, for one thing, the antennas on this isn't that big, and you're not going to get too much elevation, and you're running off of batteries, so the power output isn't going to be that high. So, what they do is they take a radio, and they put it in a high location, whether it be on a tower, on the top of a mountain, usually some place that they can get it up really high, they use really high grade feed, high grade feed line that's 
probably too expensive for you to afford to use at home. And it's just the optimal situation. Uh, and they can put out a lot more power. And what it does is it will repeat what I say on this handheld radio. It'll repeat it out, but much louder so that you can get farther distances. Uh, how it works is I would transmit on one frequency and it repeats it out on another frequency. Uh, that's what we call an offset. Uh, I'm not good with numbers, so I need to look at my laptop, but yeah, if you're transmitting on a two meter band, the offset is plus or minus 600 kilohertz. If you transmit on 70 centimeter, it's uh, plus or minus five megahertz. Uh, I'll put in the show notes for other bands what the offset is. Uh, but like I said, it, it receives on one frequency and transmits it back out on another frequency and at a much, much higher power. Now, this could get quite noisy. Repeaters could pick up you know, other transmissions, you know, accidental noise or whatever. So they use what's called a PL tone uh, to verify that the signal should be repeated out. Uh, I'll list in the show notes the different set of PL tones, but it's a tone in a sub subaudible. Yeah, I can talk today. A subaudible frequency, something far below what humans can hear. It's you, when you transmit with your radio, it sends out this tone, and that tells the repeater, okay, this is meant to be sent back out. This is meant to be repeated, and the repeater will repeat it. Most repeaters use them nowadays. You might be able to find a couple that don't, but I'd say 90% out of them use, use PL tones. One of the first things to remember when transmitting on the repeater is listen for a couple minutes, make sure there isn't somebody else talking. You don't want to be rude and jump into somebody else's conversation and step all over them. When you do transmit on the receiver, on the repeater, when you <coughs> When the person you're talking to is done talking, wait five or ten seconds before you transmit again. This gives some time for somebody else to, to step in, you know, identify. They might want to join the conversation, or there could be emergency or some kind of priority traffic that needs to get in. Uh, as with everything else in amateur radio, emergency traffic takes priority. All the rules that apply to normal traffic don't apply to emergency traffic. When talking on a repeater, even on simplex, it doesn't matter what class you have. No one has higher privileges. No one can step on somebody else. Nobody owns the airwaves. Whether you're a technician, you're an extra, or a general class, you don't own the airway. A, a, a technician doesn't have to give up the frequency they're talking on to an extra or a general. It just doesn't work that way. The only uh, the only way that you do have to give up the frequency you're talking on is to emergency traffic. They have priority over everything. If somebody comes on and they have a legitimate emergency, you either help them out or get the fuck off the airwaves. That, that's just plain simple. That's how, how it works. You can also connect to phone lines with a repeater. I'm not quite sure how to do it yet. I haven't done it myself. But... Uh, this isn't as popular as it used to be now that cell phones are available, but 10 years ago, you can get on the repeater and as you see, there's a keypad on the radio. You can dial DTMF tones and actually connect to a landline or cell phone, whatever, dial a, a phone through the repeater. Everybody on the repeater with a scanner, whatever, can listen into your phone conversation, so... You know, be careful, don't go dialing up your bank and punch in your PIN code and getting your account balance and stuff like that. Phone calls on the repeater should be limited. You know, you shouldn't sit on there for hours at a time. You know, quick, quick phone conversation is fine. Not too many repeaters now that I know of still have phone patch enabled for general use. But most of them, if you get on the repeater and you dial 911 on the keypad, it will connect you immediately to a 911 operator, and you can use that for emergencies. Uh, now let's see. But yeah, when talking on the repeater, or even on simplex, uh, just use plain English, none of the 
None of the bullshit that you hear on CB radios, uh, you know, people don't use 10 codes or, or sit there and slur and sing their call signs and stuff like that. That's all bullshit for CB radio, and all you do is piss everybody off on ham with that. Just use regular English. Uh, don't worry about making mistakes if you're new. People cor will correct you, not, not in a negative way. They'll just make suggestions and whatever. And uh, repeaters are a lot like IRC. Every repeater you go on has different etiquette. They, you know, they, not exactly rules, but people talk differently and they have different guidelines and everything. And you know, they'll inform you if, you if you do something different than how they like. Uh, sometimes repeaters are dominated by groups like uh, Aries, Racies, stuff like that. And it tends to be, majority of the people are emergency services, and they tend to shun people like me that aren't involved in emergency services, and they're just people interested in making new friends or whatever. Just find another repeater, or just use their repeater when they're not using it or whatever. Don't get discouraged. Uh, every repeater is different. You know, different communities, different groups. Uh, we're going to cut ahead to some footage. Uh, Fox and I... We're talking on the the uh, Bears Network. I think it stands for Bristol Emergency Services. Uh, we were able to communicate. I'm in Bridgeton, New Jersey. He's up in Brooklyn, New York. I was connecting to the Violin Repeater, which then connects to a couple other repeaters, and it relays it all the way back and forth. Uh, he's up in Brooklyn, New York. He was connecting to a repeater in, somewhere in North Jersey. Uh, I'll put in the show notes where it is. I forget exactly where it was. And then uh, Ugster was up in central Jersey listening in with his Pro 95 scanner. He doesn't have his license yet, but he's working on it. Uh, and he was able to hear both of us. And we'll cut to some footage to show, show the communications that we made. We also were able to talk to somebody out in, I think it was Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And towards the end, I'm not sure if we got footage of it or not, but somebody from... Uh, from Maryland came on and uh, made contact with them. So uh, I hope you found this useful and uh, watched the footage ahead and uh, we'll be covering more amateur radio segments throughout the rest of the season. Well, as we were saying before NYPD decided to go and roll through my actual recording studio. Uh, we're pushing Right now I'm pushing at least a 30 mile link and then it's what, about 150 miles from the repeater that, uh, on Bears that I'm entering down to you in, the, in my land? It, it's somewhere like that. I map quested it out in uh, driving directions. It's about, I think, 120 or 130 miles. So it's probably a little bit less radio-wise depending on exactly what path the repeaters are, are taking. I'm not really sure. But, yeah, somewhere around that. It's still pushing a, a really good distance for three watts. Yeah, this is actually a, a really widespread repeater network. This goes all the way down into Maryland. I've actually picked up people from uh, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, I don't have line of sight with the repeater because of all of the uh, apartment buildings and whatnot that are in the way where I live. So, But you do what you got to do, right? Yeah, I'm sure once eventually uh, you get a place where you can put up a better antenna, you, you'll get even farther. Uh, you'll be able to talk to people all over the place. But yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive that you can talk so far with such a low-powered HT. Uh, I, have to, I have to operate at 5 watts here. I tried bumping it down to half a watt and then to 3 watts. Uh, it didn't even peg the repeater at half a watt. At 3 watts it did, but Ugster reported that it was quite noisy. So I bumped it back up to 5 watts, and he says it sounds pretty good. Yeah, it really seems like you're having a hard time pushing the signal to get into the Vineland. You're using the double zap, right? Yeah, I'm using the double zap, but I haven't been up on the roof in months to check on it. I have no idea. Uh, you know, there could be rust on it or whatnot. I'm not sure. Uh, if I go up and clean it up, I'm sure I'll get a little bit better signal. Or if I actually, 
uh, mounted it right rather than tying it up with string while well, I have it right now. It would probably work a little bit better. This is more or less a worst case scenario, but it's working, so I'm not complaining. Well, before you start hobbling up to the roof and playing with the antenna, hold out on that until the last minute. I'm going to see if I can try to get you a 70 centimeter Yagi antenna. I need to build a few anyway. Uh, CR gave me a really good idea about using spoke, uh, the, the, the spokes from an uh, old bike tire as, uh, as the actual improvement elements. Those should actually hold up pretty well. I've been wanting to try that. So if anything, I can always design a 70 centimeter Yagi for you. And next time you come down to New York City, come on, pick it up. Well, the thing is, a lot of people are really more concerned about power output rather than a proper antenna. And, you know, really, if you don't have a proper antenna, you're not going to push the signal out. It could just be that the, uh, the double depth that you have up there right now is just the SWR match with the 70 centimeter band is a little off. Uh, do you even have an SWR meter yet? Not yet. I've been looking at them, looking at them on eBay. They're they're not too expensive. I'm probably going to pick one up. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Too many other projects to do. The extensive length of RGA that you're using on that, even though that it, it is rated for the frequency, it's going to throw the SWR off to the double depth of it. So uh, it's really not too hard to actually retune those. I'm actually going to be doing a segment on the show about that soon, so I can show you how to do that. It's pretty simple. But, you know, either way, if having a proper antenna is always more important than having high power output. Like I said, right now I'm only pushing three watts. Matter of fact, I'm going to bump this down to actually half watts, see how far I can push out. Yeah, if you're pushing a crap signal, no matter how much power is behind it pushing it, it's still going to sound like crap. Yeah, you know, power is not always a good thing, especially when you have way too much SWR and you blow out the finals. I've known people to do that. All right, I'm pushing only half watt. How well you picking me up? You sound exactly the same. There's, there's really no difference. They only half a lot of power pushing about a 40 mile length to a repeater, and I, that'll, that'll re repeat it to what? Maybe 300 miles away? I mean, I know I've gone into the far end of Pennsylvania, but I really haven't actually done a, a line of sight plot point. But, uh, you know, I guess that's what Google Maps is good for, huh? Yeah, I'll look at the I'll look at the map more uh, when I'm typing up the show notes, whatever, and try and figure out the exact square mileage that this network covers. But uh, it's pretty extensive. It's it's really impressive. What the hell was this call sign? Go ahead, calling station. Can you repeat your sign, please? I missed it. N3, JBD, November 3rd, we at Bravo Delta 4. Uh, yeah, guys, I'm uh, standing here in the backyard in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, so uh, this is a, a great system. How much wattage was he pushing? pushing? Okay. So uh, far away, we're actually recording a video right now. Uh, explaining to some some friends online uh, about repeaters and just explaining general amateur radio stuff and how it works and uh, we're demonstrating how far you can go. We're using uh, FT60 little FT Yesu FT60 radios and it's it's amazing how far we can go just pushing a half watt. Yeah, Roger, very good. Uh, yeah, I'm running a uh, full power five watt.
spots on the HT here to the, uh, the Honeybrook link. So, uh, very good. Well, I, I can't hold it. I just want to let you know that uh, uh, the system works great, at least out to uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. 73 guys, N3 JBD, uh, portable. I'll be uh, listening. Roger that. Uh, thank you, Station. It was great to hear from you. And, uh, you know, I have to agree with you. It is a really nice repeater system. Unfortunately, uh, I'm a night owl myself, and I'm, the uh, repeater turns off at 10 o'clock, and I don't wake up until then, so I miss out on all the fun. Plus, I'm actually in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York, and I've got a lot of tall apartment buildings around me, and unless I go to the waterfront, I really can't get a signal because my landlord won't let me put an antenna on the roof. But, you know, that's all the fun of amateur radio, trying to make do with what you get your hands on. In this segment, I want to get into multimeters. It's something that we should have gotten into a long time ago, but it only came up recently in chat. In front of me, I have my three primary multimeters. This is a fairly old one. I honestly don't know how old this one is. It's probably as old as I am, but it works. It works well. This is a little pocket multimeter, and this is the one I pretty much use from everyday to day use. Now, when buying a multimeter, the first thing you need to ask yourself is what kind of electronics will you, you personally be dealing with? Will you be dealing with uh, AC, DC? Are you going to be dealing with more with uh, digital electronics? Or are you going to be doing with high voltage? What are you going to be doing with your projects? Now, these three meters all have benefits and drawbacks, and I'll get into them one at a time. Now, let's uh, frame up, zoom in, and look at this little pocket multimeter that I got for Radio Shack. It costs about 20 bucks, uh, fits in your pocket. It's a pretty good multimeter, but there are some flaws. So here we have my little pocket multimeter. Now it has AC voltage up to 500 volts. I wouldn't trust it anything past 60 volts, to be honest, because these leads that, that are on it, these little thin little leads, I don't think it can handle too much voltage or amperage. Now it has DC amperage up to 200 milliamps. Now you have to remember that standard AA batteries will be 300 to be between 300 and 330 milliamps which means this thing can't even measure the current coming off of AA batteries. One major downfall of this tiny little meter. It has a diode check, which could also be used for continuity check. Continuity check, always useful. It does ohms from 200 ohms, 2 kilo ohms, 20 kilo ohms, 200 kilo ohms, and 2 mega ohms. Now, this is not an auto-ranging multimeter, meaning you have to physically move this dial to its maximum range. So if we wanted to test a 5 kilo ohm resistor, you can't put it to the 2 kilo ohm setting because 2 kilo is going to be the lowest, uh, sorry, the highest setting you can measure. So we've got to put it on the 20K. Uh, let's say we wanted to measure 120 volts AC. AC voltage being up here, we're going to put this on the 200 volt setting. Now, if you notice, the display only has three readable digits, meaning the precision to this isn't really going to be all too precise because it only has these three digits. So if we're measuring, say, 120 volts, and, you know, it'll be one, two, zero, but what happens if there's a half of a volt or a ninth of a volt? All of that's going to be cut off because the display can only display three digits. Now, for a little pocket multimeter, it's really nice. It can handle up to, uh, they say, 500 volts AC and DC. It runs off of an N-cell battery, which unfortunately get kind of expensive, and I think that's a bit of a drawback. Um, it fits in my pocket. The amperage is a bit on the low side. But for general electronics use, it's okay. I think I paid about 15, 20 bucks for it. Definitely good for a first time starter project. The probes on it are fairly nice. They actually have um, little uh, grip stops so you can't go too far. And they have really sharp points, which are actually very important when dealing with fine precision electronics. If we're doing any kind of surface mount work, you don't want to have a dull tip. I've actually known people uh, to go as far as quite literally sharpening their tips with a Dremel. It's also got these little notches in it. I don't know if you can notice it, but they have these little notches right here. So if you need to butt up against any kind of uh, component, a leg or a wire, it'll actually sit in there quite nicely and it'll actually catch. Here we have a relatively ancient multimeter. I do not know where this thing came up from. I, it's probably as old as I am, if not older. Um, it's got a four digit display. It's relatively nice. Granted, it's old, it's still usable. Now. It does actually have an auto and a manual ranging system, meaning if I put it on auto ranging, when I take the probes and I put it on a component, it'll sit there and go through the range of values 
until it automatically selects the proper one. Or you can go to the manual setting and go through the typical settings as you normally would. Now, the drawback to auto range is it takes a little while for the meter itself to get an accurate reading. Of course, again, this is being a, only a three to four digit display, it's not gonna be super accurate. Now, if you notice down here, we've actually got probes. Yes, probes are fun. These are called banana jacks. They're actually fairly, fairly common. They're easy to get your hands on. Um, they work, they do their job. Now, if you notice, we've got four ports down here. This one in the middle is called common or common ground. So we're typically gonna keep our our negative probe or our, our black lead plugged into this one. And this one is gonna test our voltage, ohms, and diode check. Now, it's all clearly labeled. You probably can't see this after the encode of the video, but it actually is labeled. And it also tries to warn you down here that this, should, this port should not go over 1,000 volts DC or 750 volts AC. These two ports here, this is a 10 amp line, meaning if I wanted to test something that was 10 amps, I'd plug into that one right over there. Now, if I wanted to test anything between milliamps and microamps, I would plug in over here. If I wanted to do anything about up to 1,000 volts, you go into this one. Now, one cool thing about this meter is it actually has an audible alert for the diode check, for continuity check. So, these are just two alligator probes, and you know, it might seem like a really stupid function, but when you're trying to go through a whole bunch of continuity checks on a circuit board, not having to look at your multimeter every two seconds to see if you actually have continuity, big plus. And this meter has it. Um, the other little meter I just showed does not have that. So you have to keep looking at your meter. Plus the fact that it actually has removable, removable probes is extremely useful because your probes will eventually wear down or perhaps you want to buy a new set that are more tailored to a job. Probably next episode we'll get into uh, homemade surface mount probes. We'll see where the show leads us. Now, as usual, this multimeter has uh, DC voltage, AC voltage, uh, AC amperage, DC amperage, as well as uh, resistance checks, all the common functions, as well as diode and continuity check. So, um, I honestly don't know how much this meter cost. Um, don't know where I got it. It just wound up in my bin one day. It works very well. Goes to show that you do not need a $400 meter to go and do, do any kind of electronics. You could probably find something like this for about $20 or $30 used on eBay. Now, one thing I didn't mention, though, is um, behind the battery pack in this meter, let me see if I can get to it, okay, runs off of two standard AA cells. Right here and right here are fuses. Now, these are actually put in place just in case you decide to go over 1,000 volts or, you know, uh, over 10 amps. Instead of blowing up your meter, you'll only blow a fuse. So, you just replace the fuses, very common part. You probably pull them out of a, a whole bunch of devices, uh, old wall warts, old power supplies, etc., etc., or you can go to your parts surplus store and get a replacement set. So, you know, old, but still useful. Here we have my primary multimeter. It has all of the typical functions. AC voltage, DC voltage, current, um, resistance, but this also has capacitance, diode check, as well as audible alert, logic, and uh, basic frequency counter. Now, this actually uses a different type of banana jack. These are called shrouded banana jacks. The reason they have shrouds over it is this multimeter is actually somewhat smart. It can actually detect which port I plug these into. So these shrouds will physically hit sensors that are in these ports. Now, just like the other multimeter, um, it does have fuses in it. This has a 10 amp max on this port, 500 volt max on this port, and this port is pretty much everything else. Now, this multimeter also comes with a transistor check. Now, I do a lot of digital electronics. I do a lot of stuff with transistors and whatnot. So having a transistor check for me is actually very useful. Now, um, this can actually also do temperature. Now, this multimeter is kind of cool because it actually is a bit more modern. You, you can actually hit the shift function, and it'll actually alternate. Now, if you notice, there's going to be gray text on the bottom and uh, yellow text on the top. And it's just like the FN key on a laptop. So when you go into that secondary function, it'll actually shift. So this can either be voltage or temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit. This can be analog voltage or it could be decibels. Uh, we can do microamps and milliamps, uh, milliamps, full amps, uh, resistors, diodes, sorry, resistors, capacitors, uh, continuity, diodes, logic, frequency, transistor. Now, it also actually has a, a really cool feature called the hold button. So if you're doing anything with frequency or you need to go and measure something, you can hit the hold button and it'll actually lock the value. Now, if you also notice, it's got a nice four-digit display. It's got this really nice rubberized uh, 
you know, body condom. So I've actually dropped this thing from quite a height, and it's actually taken quite a bit of a beating. Um, it also has a serial port. Now, this is not an absolute nece uh, necessity. I actually like it a lot. The PC side software, Windows only. I do believe there is a homebrew Linux software, but I haven't used it. Will allow me to have more precise measurements. So instead of actually having four digits, I can have six, seven, or eight digits on my actual readings, so I can get a lot more precise. It also allows me to have a rudimentary oscilloscope function, so I can physically see waveforms. It also allows me to log components, so instead of writing down in a composition notebook what resistor 1 through 9 is, I can quite literally go into the software, go into the, the actual log file, and label them. Um, not totally needed, but if you're really going to get into hardcore electronics, like me, you might want to get something. Now, your multimeter will be a long-term investment. If you treat it proper and you do not abuse it, it will last you longer than your kneecaps. As you saw from the last multimeter that I showcased, that multimeter is very, very old. Works brand new, no problems with it whatsoever. Now, as always, you want to try to keep your probes clean, you want to keep them sharp, you want to keep them tidy. You do not want to use them as tools, you do not want to pry things apart with them. And if you are going to go look for a multimeter, make sure you have the basic functions, AC and DC voltage, uh, capacitance optional, but I like, for me that's a must, resistance, current, continuity, and make sure your probes are removable, make sure that the, uh, the meter itself is fused, that way if you accidentally have it on the wrong setting, there have been times where I have lent my meter to my friends, they have put it on the wrong setting, decided to go and test a wet cell battery or something of the such, and fried my fucking meter. Fuses are your friend. Before we get into how to use a multimeter, I want to show you a little bit about probes. Now, I've got three primary probes here. These are typical probe pens, as they're called. They just have simple little needle point to them. Well, a lot of times, they'll have a little notch in it, so when you actually swipe it across a component, it will actually lock in instead of just sliding off. Um, they also have nice grip stops. They're very inexpensive. Just make sure that the probes that you have, if you're buying new probes or replacement, that you actually read the manual to your meter and you get the ones with the proper uh, the proper backing to them. So in this case, we've got the shrouded banana jacks. This next one is just typical standard alligator clips. These will not handle a lot of current or voltage, but if you just need to clamp it down with something, it works just, just fine. Um, these are the ones that have standard banana jacks. Now these standard banana jacks will actually fit inside of the shrouded banana jacks. However, I have to manually select the function in which port I'm going to be on, so watch out for that. These over here are actually called test clips. Now, I'll try to get a nice shot of it, but if you notice, it's got these little, little clampy pieces. So you can quite literally clamp onto something, and it will hold on and stay there. This is really good if you're doing things with logic, transistors, or just a component that's going to change in, in value a lot, like a potentiometer or a variable capacitor or even a power supply that's, that's getting too much uh, drain from it. Um, these are actually intended primarily for oscilloscopes, but you can, this actually has a BNC connector in it. You can get them in uh, different variants for whatever meter, or you can just cut the cable and splice in some uh, shrouded uh, banana jacks or banana jacks or whatever the hell your meter has. All right, so that's a bit about probes. Let's get into how to use a multimeter. All right, I got some random junk here. I got a battery and a couple of boards. We got my meter. We're going to go through a couple of the functions on how to properly use your multimeter. Now, first we're going to do voltage. Voltage is pretty straightforward. Now, notice my meter is kind of wavering around a little bit. It's just picking up uh, ambient voltage. So what you can do is you put the meters together, uh, put your probes together like that, and it'll zero out your display. All right. So if you're wondering if your meter is just kind of screwy or whatnot, what have you, you can always cross your leads together, it will should zero out. Now this is set to the auto range function, and that's really what's causing this to kind of go haywire, because it's, it's trying to auto range. Now of course we have a battery here, it's a wet cell, it should be uh, 12 volts, 7 amps, and we're going to put the positive wire to the positive lead, and the negative wire to the negative lead, and the meter is set to DC voltage. This is coming up as 10.66 volts. Now, if you put this in backwards, of course it's going to come up as negative. 10.66 volts, so you don't have to worry about actually putting your probes in backwards. It will not harm any meter that I know of. Okay, now if you wanted to measure an actual AC waveform, uh, like a wall outlet or what have you, you just simply go to the AC. But we're not going to do that for today because I don't feel like dragging all my crap to an outlet. Now, when you're testing amperage, I can't show you how to test amperage. Whatever you do, whenever you're testing amperage, do not plug directly into the battery. 
or your power source or whatever you're testing. You must be in series, meaning this will touch the negative lead. The wire that has unplugged from here will go to your positive probe, and it will be in series, not in parallel. If you test amperage in parallel with your source, you will either blow up your meter or blow a fuse. I've seen both of them happen. You've been warned. Same thing goes for microamps, milliamps, megaamps, kiloamps, anything to do with amperage, you must put your probes in series with the circuit. Only series. I cannot emphasize this enough. Okay, so we're going to get rid of the battery. Bugger off. Okay, got a little power supply here. We have switched to uh, resistance. So we've got a couple of resistors on the board. They're actually kind of, actually we'll use this one. This one has bigger resistors. You can probably see that a bit better. All right, so we have a resistor here and it is labeled as orange or yellow, orange, black. Resistors are not, are you in, okay, yeah, there we go. Resistors are not polarized, which means you do not, there is no negative or positive on them. So this is uh, 42.8 ohms. Now we have another one here that's brown, green, red, gold. And this is 7.48 kilo ohms. Notice how the meter is auto-ranging between the components automatically. Very useful feature. Especially if you're lazy or you just don't feel like taking your finger off the part. So we got a couple of small resistors on here. I'll try to get in and I'll weasel in here and see if I can actually get these on frame for you. I can't, honestly can't even see what this one is. This looks like it's uh, orange, black, brown. So that's 258, 260 ohm ish. And of course, all of these resist resistors have a gold band tolerance, so that's a tolerance of plus minus 5%. This one's 1 1.5, 1 1.6. See? If you notice, the auto ranging is actually throwing it off a bit. Sometimes you physically just have to kind of go in and just set the, uh, the manual range. So. 1.7 kilo ohms or 1.77 something or other kilo ohm. Now we're going to hit the shift function, or the, on my meter anyway, and we're going to go to capacitance. Now we've got a couple of capacitors around here, like uh, capacitor, 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 capacitor. Okay, so we're going to look at the capacitor. We know the capacitor's here. Okay, those two. Whatever you do, do not physically touch a capacitor that you are not aware of of its charge state. Capacitors can hold in excess of hundreds of volts. A capacitor's job, if you remember in the early episodes, a capacitor's job is to hold a short amount of electricity. Capacitors can be polarized. So we're just going to go and put these on these pads. It's going to take a little while and it should auto range. Or I might actually have a blown fuse in my meter. Yeah, I think I actually have a blown fuse in the meter. Because this should be auto-ranging, and it's not. Well, learn something new every day. Need to buy some new fuses. Yeah, well, if this meter... Let's go to the other meter. Does this meter have capacitance? This meter should have capacitance. Do you have capacitance? No, you do not have capacitance. Fuck with you. All right, can't show you capacitance. Capacitance ain't working. Fuck it. You get the point. All right, so we're going to go over to the diode test. The diode test, right now we're in continuity. And it's got this little alarm symbol. Anywhere that there is common ground. None of those have ground. That should be a common ground. No, apparently it's not. So it's quite literally continuity. It just tries to find where all of the common ground points are. Um, you can quite literally just wail through a board. Right, there's a common ground. Just to see where all your ground points are. Yeah, there's my on camera. Yeah, my am on frame. There's another ground. And a lot of times in circuits, they use a, a common ground, meaning all of the negative leads are actually coming right into the same point. So there's another ground. There's another ground. So that and that are grounded together. So if we do that and that, it should still be grounded. You get the point. Now. Diodes. Diodes are one-way gates for, for electricity, which means it'll allow electrons to flow one way, but not the other. So, um, of course, OF means out of field or out of range. So, uh, where have we got a couple of diodes? Diodes. Where's that power? It's in front of me. All right. Um, unfortunately, this power supply has some really small diodes on it. 
So uh, I don't know if I can actually get this in frame. It is kind of small. But um, diodes are polarized. It only allows voltage to go one way. Uh, some diodes only have 0.6 volt drop. Some of them have a 0.4 volt drop. Read the spec sheet to your actual diode. Now, uh, silicon diodes will actually look uh, kind of glass-like. They should have about 0.6 volt drop. These big guys here that look like uh, you know Bullet Bill from Mario Brothers, these big black ones, uh, those should have, uh, I believe, a, a 0.4 volt drop. So, knowing that a silicon diode does not have more than 0.6 volt drop, and this is only doing 0.458, we know this diode is good. Now, we put it the other way, find out, see if it's going to allow reverse voltage. No, it is not allowing reverse voltage. This diode is functional. So we'll go to one of these big uh, germanium style ones, the ones that look almost ceramic. Where do your voltage drop? 0 0.165. This is definitely well within range. And we'll do a reverse bias to it. And oh, this diode actually might be faulty. It should not allow voltage to go back the other way. Oh, it's doing its job. It just has a slower reaction time. All right, let's just test uh, one or two more just to be safe. We'll actually put this one in reverse bias, and you'll notice how as time passes, it actually gets more and more resistance until eventually it'll hit infinity or should. Yeah, these diodes might actually need to be replaced. Now, keep, oh, this one's working. Now, keeping in mind that these boards were actually pulled directly from my salvage bin. So, the drop off this one is 0 0.403 volts. That's definitely within range. How about how's the drop across this one? Nothing. No. 0 0.161 volt. It's within range, but I don't like the fact that it's actually allowing reverse bias or a polarity to flow the wrong way. See, that I don't like. This is telling me that this diode is actually unhealthy. I might want to actually go out and replace this. So if this was, this is actually a working power supply out of something. Um, the power supply actually failed. So if I were to replace this diode and any other components that were on this board, I can reuse this power supply. Or if you don't care about noisy, noisy lines or perhaps more voltage than you should have, you can go ahead and use this. Now, the, uh, the diode check can also be used to check fuses. Now, I got a little fuse here. Okay fuse works. So if you can't physically see if a fuse is working or not, there you go. All right. Those are some of the tips and techniques on how to what, what to look for in a multimeter and how to use one. I'll put some information in the show notes, maybe some vendors and suppliers and different brands of, of multimeters, depending on uh, you know what kind, of, uh, what kind of electronics you want to get into. So I hope this was uh, in any way, shape, or form informative. Otherwise, bugger off.